In today's lesson, we start with the idea of an age structure diagram. And age structure diagrams are going to be a graphic representation of a population and the range in which the people's ages in this graph we have every 10 years. So we treat this as a kind of a bar graph that's split down the middle because on the left hand side we have the male representation on the right hand side we have the female representation this number just represents I guess for this graph the total population that was surveyed and what we can say is that on the left hand side if I were to say how many people in this population were males between the ages of 0 and 9 I would find this bar graph and say alright this is from 0 so we're out to about 6 or 7 percent of the individuals so you can kind of see what the overall graph shape tends to be where the most number of people, sorry, I'm moving it, uh, are definitely in their younger years. It's, it's very cylindrical. If you take a, an average of all these until we reach, we can kind of see that people are expected to potentially live into their 80 plus years. So this is a important diagram for countries to decide what type of environment you can kind of predict what type of country you have based on the structure of their demographic and demographic information is really about population. Demography is the study of, of populations. Demographic transition is a process where you change from a high birth rate and a high death rate to a low birth rate and a low death rate. So you can think of developing countries as countries that have a high birth rate because of potential medicine or preventative uh, contraception for individuals that they don't have the health care to prevent any type of pregnancies so therefore they have a lot of children but they also have a high death rate because of also lack of medicine so there that graph would tend to be more of a pyramid shape a lot of individuals in the young range and then tailoring right to the top very quickly all right that would be a low death or sorry a high death and a high birth rate on the opposite side, this is kind of one of those spectrum or graphs that would be more along the low birth, low death. Um, it is more overall cylindrical in shape. You obviously have to have less people up here. There is going to be death that occurs, but you can kind of tell that there is a lower death rate just due to the fact of how high this goes up into the 80s. Um, it's not a drastic cutoff, but you start to see into the 50s, 60s. So that's a somewhat developed countries. So United States, um, many European countries would have this shape, Canada. So those are what countries would vie to get to because you kind of have an insinuation that developed countries that have a, a transition would have had health care and things like that where people were, were kept on this planet, but they also were prevented. You know, they, they only came to have children when they really want to have children um, in most cases. So that's demographic transition. Along the lines of birth and death rate, we have what are called patterns of mortality. And so different species have different expectations of when or how they might die. So the three types right here, as you can see, are shown type one, type two, and type three. So the axes are not labeled here, but what we would say is this x-axis would be the lifespan. So think of a typical lifespan for humans. It might start obviously down here at zero and then proceed up to about 100. But for a dog, this x-axis might be completely different. So it's not like a standard. It's just the lifespan that would be typical for that organism you are researching. This y-axis would be more, think of it as the likelihood of surviving. And so type one, if we take the general trend here, we have, they have the most likely to survive in their younger years. Whereas type two and type three, they drop down much quicker. So you would expect someone early on in their lifespan to continue to live. And then towards the end, that's where the expectation of death would occur towards the end of that spectrum uh, or span. That would be examples such as humans. So you would be very shocked to see in an obituary a young person. You would kind of say, what happened? That's not typical. That's an indication of a type 1. If you can't really predict or know that how long they're going to survive, you kind of think dogs are probably like that as well. You know, there's a, a lifeline that you expect your dog to get to 
maybe it might be 12, 13 years. And if a dog that you know is only two years old had passed away for some reason, you know there's something different about that scenario. That didn't fit the, the typical situation. Type 3 is the next one I'm going to skip to. And so this is one where there's a lot of expectation of death early on for some reason. Maybe it's an environmental factor. We'll talk about some examples. But then as you kind of proceed past that first span where you're, you like made it, you are surviving, you kind of have a, a higher likelihood that you're going to make it to the end. So think of sea turtles as your most common example of a type three. So why might sea turtles be more likely to not survive early in their life? I hope you're thinking about ideas like you know that they have to travel from where they get hatched on land. They have to make it to the sea. And in that, that span where they're walking, they could be snatched by a predator. Other things that are type 2, you kind of see it's a very linear progression. So there's no real expectation. There's, there's nothing greater or less than across this whole thing. They often say birds are that example where apparently there is no lifespan expected for a bird. You, you wouldn't be hard-pressed or surprised if a bird dies early, middle, or late in a potential lifespan of some birds. Um, I think type 1 and type 3 are more often the examples that a textbook would use or one that they would expect you to come up with a good example. Type 2, I think there's just fewer of them out there. So we talked about growth rate um, when we were talking about things that affect population size. And here we have the words immigration, emigration. We've talked about them actually in evolution, saying that this was one of the criteria provisions of Hardy-Weinberg, saying that if you want to maintain a genetic equilibrium, you can't immigrate or emigrate. Immigrate just means that organisms are coming into a population or entering. Emigration with an E is leaving a population. If you want to know the growth rate, it's a simple subtraction. Take that um, birth rate. I know this is kind of... Uh, coming back from things that we talked about in an earlier video, but the birth rate could take into effect the immigration emigration status. So overall, growth rate is a birth rate minus death rate. So you can expect a negative value would mean that you have more deaths in the population than birth, so the population would be declining. That's why they put death second in that equation. You could account for also immigration and emigration. So if you kind of added that to the equation, which one do you think you would have as a negative value where negative represents a lower population? You would expect emigration to be second in that equation. So if you did immigration minus emigration, then if you have more people that are leaving a population, then that number is going to be a negative value compared to those that are coming in. So therefore, the growth rate would be negative and your population would be going down. So those are two different ways to calculate growth, um, looking at two different variables of birth and death rate and immigration and emigration. So populations grow, we know, and a few days ago I showed you the video about human population growth and how we're in this exponential growth curve. It's, it's just literally climbing. I had said that there was going to be a, a place where it has to stop, and that could range about 10, predicted 10 billion to about 12 billion people. Notice that this is what actually happens. Once that 10 to 12 billion hits, there is going to be a somewhat leveling off. There's a reason why populations do not grow forever. Bacteria can't grow forever. Bacteria have hit this point many times where they can grow to a certain point, And then what has to happen is this says the population size has somewhat remained constant. This area is called the carrying capacity. So you can label it, define it over here. Carrying capacity is the maximum amount of people or organisms that one particular environment can support. So we are saying that the Earth can only have a carrying capacity of roughly 10 to 12 billion people. That's what they're expecting. That's our carrying capacity. Carrying capacity can be played over in to your house. How many people do you think can fit in a house that you live in? You know, whether it's just living quarters um, or just People coming over, how many people, that's that's carrying capacity. Think of it in that, that manner. Now, what's going to control population sizes? What's the reason why there is a carrying capacity? We have these regulators. There are two different types of factors that can contribute to controlling the size of a population. So they are known as density-dependent and density-independent factors. And... 
Density independent factors are simply defined in my terms as factors that would be an issue on population size regardless of how densely populated the area is. I don't think you necessarily need to know a definition. I'm sure you want to write that down. But I think examples show better what a density independent factor is. A lot of weather, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, those are density independent factors. They did not get any stronger or weaker because there was more or less people on a particular area. It happened. It obviously is going to, if there's more people there, has more possibility of killing more people or controlling it. But the factor itself is density independent. Doesn't matter how many people were there, the factor is still present. So a lot of weather things, you might have other ideas. And if you want to ask me, feel free to say, this is what I'm thinking as well as another example. Density dependent factors, by the name sake it says, these are factors that really only pose an issue because of the sheer amount of people or things that are there. So factors that increase as more people enter that population. So disease is an example. Disease spreads quicker and faster, sorry, it's the same thing, quicker as more people enter the population. So that would be a good example of a density dependent factor. The other examples, the number of nesting sites for a bird. There's only so many places that they can potentially nest. So the more people or more birds that would fly into that environment, that's going to have an effect on how many birds can be in that area. There's a lot more plentiful and and diverse answers for density dependent that I've seen. So feel free to think of other examples and come to me and ask if there's if these might be more. But density independent tend to be more weather related. That's how I've often seen. They can't really get away with giving a lot of broad scope examples. So what I'll do is I'll stop there before we progress into the next topic. So um, until then.